Welcome to part two of our video on German Riesling. In this video, we discuss two of the top regions in Germany for the production of high quality Riesling, namely Nahe and Rheinhessen. After that, we get into the German wine quality pyramid and discuss all six tiers of Pratiquette's wine. We conclude by discussing German geographic classification. If you haven't seen part one yet, go ahead and watch this video and then you can always go back and see part one as they're designed to be independent. In part one, we discuss Riesling, the grape, and its characteristics and different expressions, and we cover three of the top regions for the production of high-quality Riesling in Germany, namely Falls, the Mosel, and Rheingau. Nahe is a fairly large region, but there's only a small amount of producers there. They tend to be scattered around, and so there can be some variation in terms of the growing conditions for these producers. It has some shelter from some mountains, and the temperatures tend to be a little bit milder than some of the other regions, certainly than of the Mosul. You have some stylistic differences as well. In the Nahe, you tend to have more body and a little bit more alcohol by volume and lower acidity than in the Mosul, but you definitely also have more acidity and a lighter body than what you find from Rheinhessen and the Rheingau. So it's kind of in the middle of those other regions. In terms of plantings, Nahe is dedicated to about 75% white wine, and Riesling accounts for around 30% of the total plantings in Nahe. I love the Nahe. It's this giant valley. It's kind of like a secret valley in a way. It's so beautiful. You have so many amazing producers, such a small area. You've got Dunhoff, you've got Emmerich Schoenleber, uh, you've got Dr. Crucius, um, you've got Good Hermansburg. And then I got to give a shout out to my guy, and I work with Good Hermansburg as well, but Andy Schneider of K.H. Schneider, Carl Heinz Schneider. He's in kind of the unsexy area. Uh, you also have Schaefer Froelich, by the way, uh, you know, of uh, the Nahe in Sobernheim. And everyone thinks more of kind of Schloss Bockelheim or Niederhausen or Norheim or whatnot. Uh, but, you know, Andy's in Sobernheim and he's working two sites, Marbach. Domberg. He also has some Felsenberg, and he has another site called Konigsfels. And, you know, he's not in the VDP, but he's a little engine that could. He just makes exceptionally beautiful mineral-driven wines. The Nahe is just, it's just beautiful. I mean, it's one of the most striking regions. You know, it feels separated from the other regions more than any other wine region out there, I find. You know, the Rheinhessen is kind of connected, you know, to maybe the southern part of the Nahe. And uh, in a way, especially where someone like Wagner Schnempel is in Holberg, Mosel and the Nahe, they're very not connected, you know. I mean, there is a similarity in style, but there are certain areas of the Nahe that are cooler than the Mosel. I mean, some of these good Hermansburg wines, for example, just they are cool climate reason. There is no question about it. I always get in the Nahe cherries. I know it's strange to get that in a white wine, but white cherries, Rainer cherries, you know, sometimes red cherries, but I definitely get those uh, in the Nahe. And the Nahe is pretty amazing in that it's famous equally like the Mosul for sweet wine and for dry wine. Uh, but now the most famous wines by far uh, in the Nahe, Hermann Zola GG from Donhoff, Felsenmeck GG from Schaefer Froelich, Hallenberg, and Fruin Spotson GG from Schoenleber. I mean, these are the leading lights of the Nahe and the most famous wines, and the sweet wines are almost forgotten. I mean, Good, good Hermansburg has, you know, there's six or seven GGs that they make, you know, Rosenberg and Tracer Bastai and Kufa Gruba, etc. Uh, I mean, there's still, you know, and it, what put the Nahe on the map for all of, you know, the, you know, you wine geeks, you know what I'm about to say. When the 2001 Donhoff, Niederhauser, Hermann's Oldish Spate Lace got 97 points by Mr. Pierre Antoine Ravani, um, that kind of was like a huge kind of moment, you know, Neil Armstrong landing on the moon moment uh, for Nahe Riesling. And it just took off after that. No one thought that like a wine from the Nahe could get 97 points in the pages of the Wine Advocate back then. That's when the Wine Advocate was like really the only game in town. The Rheinhessen is a very large region, both in terms of geographic area and in terms of its production output. In fact, it produces almost one quarter of Germany's wines. Around 71% of plantings are white grapes, and certainly Riesling is the most planted grape in the Rheinhessen. There's a number of mountain ranges that provide shelter to this region, and so it tends to be a little bit warmer and drier. 
While historically it's been known as a source for lots of bulk wine and inexpensive wine, it's increasingly becoming the location that is also capable of producing high quality Riesling as well. When I think of the Rheinhessen, I think of the expression, you come a long way, baby. Because basically, at the end of the day, the Rheinhessen was a bulk wine region that made Flying Nun. We've all heard of Flying Nun. That was the most famous wine out of the Rheinhessen. And now they're home to Keller, who is the Romani Conti of Germany. I mean, to come from Flying Nun to Keller is pretty remarkable. And you have pretty much like two areas in the Rheinhessen that are important for high quality wine the Rotrahang, which is around Nierstein in Nockenheim. But it's definitely around Nierstein, and that's where you have Nierstein Hipping, Nierstein Pettenthal. These are some of the greatest Grand Cru vineyards in all of Germany. Uh, Nierstein Olberg as well. And also, Nierstein is one of the unique areas outside of the Mosul where you can create high quality Mosul like cabinet. Uh, there's a producer I used to work with, don't work with anymore, named Schatzel, and he is 75% of his production is cabinet. And uh, it's, it's pretty remarkable. You know, the Rotrahang is distinguished by, you know, the soil. I'm going to murder the pronunciation. Uh, Rotzligenden, I'm sorry. You know, I am from New York. It's very hard for me to pronounce these German words. Uh, you know, iron rich red soil consisting of slate, clay, and sandstone. It is true that the Rieslings from the Rotrahang are incredibly smoky. I mean, there is nothing like having a mature bottle of Hipping or a Tall. They are some of the most extraordinary wines on the planet. They are like cut from a diamond and they have all this smoke and they have this tropical fruit. And when people think of tropical fruit, they think overripe. But no, this is perfectly ripe tropical fruit. Not too ripe, not underripe, just perfect. There's nothing better than biting into like an actually ripe mango, not some like overripe mango or underripe mango, but you want it perfectly ripe. And that's what the Rheinhessen does probably better than any uh, wine producing uh, area in Germany. I have famous producers in the particularly the Rotorhang area, Battenfeld Spanier, Kuling Gio. And you also have Schatzel, Bonnegau. It's the southern Rheinhessen. And the fam most famous town is Florsheim Dalsheim. That's where Keller is. That's also where Sechthaus Romland is, the top sparkling wine producer in all of Germany right now. You know, you've got Gunderlach down there. You have Keller down there. Um, and those are, you know, the two top producers. I mean, and what Keller has done, you know, for German wine is remarkable. I mean, I cannot even put it in words. I mean, and he is one of the nicest people in German wine, but he has made German wine. I mean, the others, you know, a great wave lifts all boats, as they say. The boats are still in the process of being lifted, to be clear. But there are other people that are making wines that are on a similar qualitative level than Keller, notably Schaefer Froelich in the Nahe, I think Christman as well in the Faults, and a couple others. Uh, but, you know, there's a mystique about Keller, you know, in, in that. If no one's ever heard of German dry wine, they've heard of Keller. And he's expanding. He's making sparkling wine. He's making, you know, really interesting sweet wine. You know, there's dry Chardonnays now. I mean, he's really, you know, the Mosul stuff. I think he even has a vineyard planted in Norway uh, for his grandchildren. You know, doing really, really incredible stuff. And he's, you know, he's single-handedly, yes, he is in the Vonnegau in Florsheim, Dalsheim, but he does have vineyards, you know, uh, he does make a Pettenthal, he does make a Hipping. Um, you know, all that. And also he makes Absair and obviously the G-Max, which everyone wants, which is pretty spectacular. Uh, and the Rheinhessen is just such an exciting area for Riesling right now. I mean, you know, just all these amazing producers making these world-class wines. And, uh, you know, really, I mean, no one expected 40, 50 years ago that like Rheinhessen would put German wine on the map, but here we are. And it's, uh, you know, done just a tremendous, remarkable, incredible job. But there's also a ton of bad producers in the Rheinhessen. It's a quarter of the German vineyards. So whenever you have a lot of something, there's going to be some bad and some good. Uh, so just because it says Rheinhessen on the label doesn't mean it's good. If you're interested in wine recommendations, wine collecting strategies, and learning more about wine, please do subscribe to my channel. I've been collecting wine for more than 15 years and also have a level four diploma from the WSET. So I have both formal certification as well as substantial practical knowledge from the School of Hard Knocks. So now that we know a little bit about the different expressions of Riesling, we're going to get into the German classifications in the quality pyramid. Of course, these were just revised a little bit in 2021, so it's even a little bit more complicated than it used to be. 
first category is called Deutscher Wine, and it's without a geographic destination. Honestly, you will never see this in the United States. You'll see it in Germany, in supermarkets, gas stations, and, and whatnot. Uh, it's the most basic wine category in EU legislation, and the label can only have a vintage and grape variety. Uh, that's it. So you're not going to see Rheingau or Rheinhessen or Mosel or whatnot. I mean, I don't think I've ever seen one of these in the United States. So it's just kind of the beginning. Then you have Landwein, which is wine from one of Germany's 28 kind of defined areas. Uh, for example, a Rheingauer Landwein or a Baden Landwein. Um, the label can have the name of the Landwein region, uh, and the grapes are grown. Uh, but may not state a village or vineyard name, but they can have something called fantasy names. Now, this is important uh, because some of the greatest producers in Germany classify their wines as land wine in order to get out of some of these restrictions of classification uh, that kind of the higher things will have. Hans Peter Zereitzen of Zereitzen in Baden uh, is probably the most famous example of this. All his wines are marketed as land wine, and each wine has a different label. His new title, one is named Beweiser, another is named Steingrubel, another one is named Jaspis 10-4 Alter Raven, but they're all land wine. But land wine in general, the producers, the wines are generally not particularly interesting unless you know that it's a producer who's striving for quality. Then the next is something that you will see, Folliet's wine. Uh, and this is something that has to come from a defined origin. The minimum must weigh ranges from 50 to 72 Uxla, depending on the origin. Uxla, by the way, equals bricks in California, uh, which is ripeness level, sugar level, sugar level when picked. Um, and the wine may be enriched. And the final category of the German wine quality pyramid is Pratikot's wine. This is a category that is below, I mean, like a branch of Pratikot's wine. And in most cases, you have higher mush requirements, higher ripeness, 70 to 154 Uxla, and you cannot add Swiss Reserve. We're going to go through six different categories of Pratiket's wine, and they are Cabinet, Spätlese, Ausschlese, Berenausschlese, Eiswein, and Trockenberenausschlese. So we're going to discuss each of these in turn. So you have kind of Cabinet wines, the most feathery and lightweight wines with huge acid and a balance between kind of sugar um, and acidity. And at the end of the day, for all of the categories that I'm about to say, besides the really, really sweet ones, a great German Riesling, even with sugar, should finish, the finish of the wine, the aftertaste in your mouth, should be somewhat dry and savory, even if it is sweet. Typical cabinet with sugar, you're gonna have between seven, eight, 8.5%. Typical cabinet without sugar, you will have probably, I mean, for me, the sweet spot is 10.5, 11% for a cabinet, uh, cabinet trochen. Cabinet has to have high acidity, uh, and generally the flavors are more kind of towards the green of the, of the spectrum, uh, or if there's grapefruit, it's going to be kind of like pink grapefruit. You're not going to be talking red grapefruit or anything like that. And another thing about cabinet, I don't know if this is true, but someone that is a good friend of mine, Stefan Steinmetz, tells me, Cabinet wines will age longer than Spätlese, Auslese, BA, and TBA. I love Cabinet. It's probably my favorite of the Pratty Cop categories, uh, especially it's my favorite of the sweet wines because, you know, they're so easy to drink. Um, and then next you have Spätlese. That's fully ripened grapes that are picked around two weeks after Cabinet. They're kind of bigger, more concentration. They can have more sweetness, but again, if it's fermented, the sugar is fermented out, it can be Spätlese trochen confuse anybody, but you know, you have the Gross Gravox wines. I'm jumping forward a little bit, uh, but below Gross Gravox wines, you have Orts wine, and most of those are Spätlese trochens, uh, which is a dry Spätlese. And for me, that is the greatest category to introduce someone to German wine. Cabinet trocken, too geeky, they can be a little bit too severe sometimes, uh, but Spätlese trocken, that is the category to introduce because you have minerality and you have fruit. Cabinet trochen, fruit is definitely not the focus of those wines in general. They the alcohol is seven and a half percent, seven percent, and eight percent maybe for spätlese. You know, just the dry wines because you know a dry spätlese trochen for me the sweet spot is around twelve and a half percent, twelve percent, ideally twelve percent. I mean, 
sometimes uh, uh, rotations that are 11, 11 and a half percent, which I adore. Uh, but those are hard and rare to pull off. Certainly one of my favorite food pairings with the Spätlese is spicy food like Indian or Thai food. In fact, just the other day I had an Indian dish that had a lot of spice to it. And that residual sugar in the Riesling just tamed down the heat a little bit and it was an absolute dream pairing. I definitely come from the camp that Spätlese can go with almost anything. I mean, if you want to go to classic French desserts, I think Spätlese and Tarte Tarton, Tarte Tarton is unbelievable. I mean, moderately spicy or tiny bit spicy Chinese food, Spätlese works so beautifully. But then Spätlese Trokin or Cabinet Trokin, I make a shift and I go straight to the Japanese restaurant and I'll do an omakase sushi dinner because I think the versatility uh, of dry Riesling works all the different types of uh, sushi and sushi, you know, the only spice that you have is wasabi, which generally sometimes the chef will put a little bit uh, on the pre-prepared, uh, you know, sashimi or sushi, or you can add as much as you want, so you can kind of like gauge your spice level. With Thai food, you can't gauge your spice level, so, I mean, a dry, there's nothing worse. Also, another thing, this is super important, spate lace are wonderful with spicy food. But spate lace, trokin, a dry spate lace, awful with spicy food. Now, here's a little life hack. If the German wine label is complicated, if you're in a rush and you don't know if it is dry or sweet, there is a small thing that you can do that can tell you if it's dry or sweet. Look at the alcohol level. If the alcohol level is 7, 8%, it's sweet. If it's 12 or 13, it's dry. That's it. If there's all these complicated German words and you're in a big rush, boom, just uh, look at the alcohol level. Right, and you've kind of talked about it a little bit already, but what can you tell us about Ausschlesser? Ausschlesser is the most important German wine category because it's kind of the root of the Grossgravach um, classification. Uh, but it's basically specially selected, hand-picked grapes. They're more concentrated than Spätlese. Uh, there's kind of enormous bodies to them and an enormous concentration, but they still are nimble, which is for me one of the top characteristics of Riesling. Some of them can have botrytis, which is that, you know, that noble rot that is famous for Sartain. It also happens in Germany as well. Then you get kind of these honeyed grapes with lots of citrus, more kind of like marmalade character uh, to it. And it adds complexity. If you have too much botrytis, it's like too much of anything. It's not a good thing. And Auslese can be dry and the GG, which is Germany's, as I said, answers to Grand Cru's or Chablis and Burgundy. Uh, are all Auslese Trokin, every single one, because the minimum must grade for an Auslese Trokin or a GG wine uh, is Auslese must grade. Auslese can be very sweet uh, in style, and but also very dry, and I think, I mean, I love Auslese, you know, I'm a big fan of JJ Prum and all these different people, uh, but all the people that are drinking GGs, drinking these Keller wines or whoever, Schaefer Froelich, uh, you know, Dunhoff, all these wines are Auslese Trokins. So while people think Auslese is the greatest sweet wine category, it's also the greatest dry wine category. So it's, for me, the greatest category. Now we have Baron Auslese, uh, which is where you officially get into the sweet wine category. Baron Auslese's are 99.9% .9 sweet. I've run into two in my life that are dry. They're curiosities that were only made by the winery and kept at the winery. And BA, short for Baron Auslese, it's made from individually selected berries, which is very important. The, and that's why they're so expensive, because the labor intensity that goes into making these wines is unparalleled in the wine world, maybe in Sauterne, maybe at Chateau of Camus. And basically, uh, you know, you have to have huge, high must weights. Everything's harvested by hand. And the wines were 99.9% .9 sweet. Fermentation can be long and slow, very low levels of alcohol. I mean, you're not getting drunk off that in Auslese. If you try to get drunk off that in Auslese, you'll probably have an anaphylactic shock first. And the minimum alcohol level for this and ice wine is 5.5. You have lots of botrytis, lots of richness, but again, the key to a sweet wine, especially a BA, you have to have lightning acidity, Zeus levels of acidity. Now we come to ice wine, one of my absolute favorite German categories. It's given its own Pratikot category in 1982, so somewhat recent. The minimum must, must weigh to the same as BA, 
of the various ones be picked when they are frozen. And that is very hard. And you have to do it at like three, four in the morning when it's dark. You know, you have to have all these kind of lights on your head, like you're, you know, exploring a cave or something. And uh, the temperature usually needs to go below negative seven Celsius, which is 19 Fahrenheit. Um, and the harvest can only take place from December to February. And, you know, basically, uh, once picked, the grapes must also be pressed while frozen. And then once it's pressed, you release tiny amounts of naturally concentrated juice with high levels of sugar and acid. And this is very important in ice wine, is that the acidity is retained in the grape because of the freezing. And the grapes used must be extremely healthy. Uh, and sometimes the grapes made for ice wine are not from really famous vineyards. Sometimes they can be. And the grapes have to be healthy, as I said, because unpleasant flavors of any would be amplified along with other flavors. Ice wine is like Riesling under a microscope. Uh, and uh, it, I love it because it has, it has that incredible acidity and it still has all the rich flavors of like a BA or a TBA or something. Uh, that it has the most focus of any of the sweet wines. It's my favorite German sweet wine, personally, in this category of BA, ice wine, TBA, to be clear. And the other thing about ice wine, I don't think you need to age them. Controversial view, I know. But I like them young. Uh, it is rare, and it's much rarer now, uh, to be clear, because of climate change slash global warming, because uh, it's just warmer in that November through February time. Uh, so global warming, bad for ice wine, but good for dry wine and good for Pinot Noir and obviously uh, other things. Now TBA, truck and baron auslacen, literally translated as single berry picked. TBA is very famous because the most expensive wines in Germany are TBA. You got Mueller or Scharzhofer, the TBA is the most expensive and most famous example. And it's basically, you have to have an extremely ridiculously high moss weight. Uh, so all the grapes generally are affected by botrytis. Uh, you know, your moss weight sometimes can go up to 300, 315. In 2003, which was a very warm vintage in Germany, I was visiting Robert Weil, and they tasted me on some TBAs that were between 300 and 400 Ursula, which is just absurd. To give you an idea, you get like a 750 milliliter bottle of wine, and if you have 315 Uxla, you know, your bottle of wine is like this, it's filled to sugar to like around here. That's around 350 Uxla right there for you. So we're talking major sugar. You know, and basically the high must weight means that the fermentation is long and slow. There are people still fermenting their 2021 TBAs right now. And uh, these don't get above 8%, but one of the problems that German producers have is getting that alcohol into the legal limits. I mean, I've tasted things in cellars that are not for commercial sale that are 3%, 4%, you know, 5%, uh, which is much easier to make than getting it to around 6 or 7% uh, alcohol. Yields are ridiculously low. Uh, most people are making anywhere. Some people are making only 36 bottles. Some people are making 100 bottles. And these are half bottles, not full bottles. Aging TBA, they can age for a very, very long time because what, what, what ages wine? You know, preservatives and sugar is the best preservative and usually you have high acidity. But when a TBA is done correctly and amazingly, there is nothing like it. The contrast between the sweetness and the richness and the acidity and the exoticism of flavors. You get flavors in TBA that you don't get in any other product top of Germany. Germany. We're going to talk a little bit about the geographic hierarchy in Germany. There's different classifications that are sort of modeled on the Burgundy system. The category that you'll typically find at the lower end is region. And so if there's a category that's based on region, it will have to include the name of the region on the label. After that, you move up to the village wine level, which is Ortwein. And if you have an Ortwein, you'll have the name of the village on the label. From there, you move up to single vineyard wine, which is called Einzelage. And within the Einzelage category, you could have further classifications of Erstesgewachs and Grossgewachs. For the Einzelage category, the wine has to have the minimum must weight of cabinet or higher. Single vineyard wine can be dry or sweet, and this is definitely one of the most important categories of German wine. Now I will speak a little bit about German classification, and whenever anybody needs to speak about German classification, oh boy, do we need a glass of wine.
Uh, the Germans never miss an opportunity to classify their wines. That is for sure. There have been so many revisions in German classification, uh, and it's really impossible to keep track of, and it definitely confuses and kind of turns away some consumers. Uh, what I do is, for me, the greatest classification in the world is Burgundy. Uh, those Cistercian monks knew what they were doing, and I love the idea of, you know, this kind of regional classification and a premier crew and then a brown crew uh you know maybe you know with the and, and village of course and all those and kind of when i talk about german wine i speak about it in burgundian terms and especially when you have the gross box and ursus box and ursus box just to be clear are just gross box they're in the wine gown that's all it is you can't say ursus box or the malhe or the mosel um and gross box are pretty much everywhere else um, and these, this is Germany's answer to Burgundy. To simplify it, you know, each producer in general has a Bourgogne Blanc or Bourgogne Rouge, uh, you know, which is kind of like uh, an Orts wine or, or, or a regional wine. Um, you know, if you take just, I don't know, you know, I think uh, taking a, uh, an estate that is relatively kind of simple, uh, that I'm familiar with. I work with a guy in Manahe, Andy Schneider, for example, who's not in the BDP. I'll get into that later, don't worry. There's another confusing thing. And, you know, he has a Orts wine, which is called Riesling Roger Tom Schieffer. Um, and basically, uh, it's from Sobernheim. It says Sobernheim Riesling Roger Tom Schieffer. Uh, and that is basically his Orts wine. It's from a village, Sobernheim. It's not from a main vineyard. Um, and it's a village level of quality wine. It's exceptional quality and it's delicious. And then you go up and he has single vineyard wines. He has Domberg, he has Marbach, and then he has Felsenberg, and then he has Konigsfels. These are his four single vineyard wines. And Marbach and Domberg and Felsenneck, or Felsenberg, excuse me, are made sweet and dry. Um, you have Domberg Trocken, Domberg Spätlese, and that's it. Every year, Domberg Trocken, Domberg Spätlese. These are his quote unquote blind crews. If he was in the VDP, which is like a German trade guild, uh, kind of, uh, then it would be called a Grossgebach. But he's not in the VDP, so it's just called Marbach Trocken. So the only end, you know, it's actually a small scrape, etc. Um, and then he has a Marbach Spätlese and a Domberg Spätlese. And, and that's it. And, you know, in general, like all the producers, no matter if they make Pinot Noir or Riesling or Weissberg or anything, I always will classify it as, you know, a Grand Cru wine, a village wine, or a Premier Cru wine. But generally in Burgundy, you're making one Grand Cru wine from one Grand Cru vineyard. Uh, but in Germany, you're making, I don't know, 19 wines from one vineyard in the same year. And they, the difference is what? You know, this is, you know, Spätlese, this is Cabernet, this is Auslese, this is Auslese, this is, you know. So that's the that's the kind of the canary in the coal mine there is that Germans can make as many wines as possible from one Grand Cru vineyard. You can make a Cabernet, you can make an Auslese, you can make a dry wine, you can make blah, 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 blah. You know, in Burgundy, you know, you're making Bon Romane Pro Pollen too. You're not making Bon Romane Pro Pollen II, Spec Basic Trokin, Bon Romane Pollen II, Ice Wine. You're not making any of these different things. So it's, you know, that is the hump they need to get over. I don't think they will get over it eventually. They can figure anything out. They put their own minds to it, the Germans. Um, and uh, they will, you know, will figure this out. The most important thing is they figure out how to make great wine.